you for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Sylvie, and I'm going to introduce one of the resources maintained our, by our group, uh, the Single Cell Expression Atlas. So, um, uh, as uh, Anna said, I'm a, a member of the gene expression team head here at the API, and our team maintains several resources for both data submission and archival and data integration and visualization. And these two we call the knowledge basis expression atlas and single cell expression atlas, which I'm going to focus on today. So this is a, just a short sort of outline for today's talk. First, I'm going to talk about um, the single cell sequencing in general. Why do we, why should we even bother with it? Or should we? Uh, what are the various uh, single cell sequencing methods and, and, and the challenges and pitfalls linked to these? And finally, I'm going to introduce the uh, single cell expression and atlas resource and how to use it and how to search data in it. So uh, why should we do single cell gene expression or single cell sequencing? Why is it at all interesting? So um, the, the cell is basically the basic unit or building block of life. Um, it is estimated that a human body, for instance, contains some 37 trillion of different cells. And these come in many different shapes and sizes. And this is, of, of course, all underpinned by the difference in the gene expression profiles. So um, with the traditional uh, method of bug sequencing that I assume you are all probably familiar with, uh, where you take a piece of tissue or a population of cells and uh, sequence it as a whole, you are masking a lot of this variety. So it is a little bit like making a smoothie. You take a mix of different fruits and blend them together, which obviously obscures how much and what the kind of different fruits actually went into your smoothie in the first place. In contrast with the single cell uh, expression, uh, you, you are preserving this information because uh, you are sequencing the individual cells and at the end of the analysis you uh, get expression profiles for each of these distinct cell types which reveals the heterogeneity uh, in your tissue or different uh, subpopulation of cells and also shows the variability in the gene expression across all the cells in the sample. Whereas with the bulk sequencing where you're mixing all these cells together you end up with, a, with an expression profile that actually represents an average across all the cells in that sample. Um, so uh, single cell sequencing therefore opens the possibility to study and understand heterogeneous samples um, such as you know, during uh, immune or stem cell development or it, helps, it can help us to identify uh, rare cell types that we just sort of get lost in the crowd uh, with bulk sequencing. It can help us understand several cellular transitions and switches uh, between different cell states, as well as like help with uh, detecting complex infections or revealing drug resistance genotypes uh, in uh, disease treatments. So uh, single cell sequencing has had a massive impact on uh, various fields of biology already. Um, I've highlighted a few examples here. For instance, in uh, neurobiology, because neurons actually represent one of the most morphologically diverse population of cells, and the traditional classification has relied mainly on morphological features. Whereas with single cell sequencing, what you get is a very powerful and unbiased method of classifying these cells based on what they do uh, and what genes they express, rather, what they look like. Um, similarly, in organogenesis, our sort of classification of cell types has for decades relied on a very limited and small number of, uh, of cell markers to distinguish different cell types. Uh, again, single cell sequencing can bypass all this and, and offer an unbiased approach and an unbiased way of classifying cell types based on their expression. Um, finally, during carcinogenesis, um, cells tend to accumulate mutations and then diversify to form distinct lineages and subpopulations within each tumor, uh, which then creates a lot of diversity, not only within the tumor, but also between different tumors of the same type. So uh, uh, single cell 
sequencing can overcome uh, this sort of confounding practice and can help design uh, and tailor treatment specifically to patients based on uh, the on the clonal diversity of the tumor tissue. Um, so to help them basically tailor the um, uh, the treatment uh, the best in the best possible way. However, um, there are a number of challenges with uh, single cell transcriptomic profiling experiments. Um, one of them is um, due to the simple fact that most uh, crown sequencing methods are DNA based, uh, which requires conversion uh, of mRNA to cDNA, which then actually needs to be amplified quite a lot um, to, uh, to gain a sufficient amount for effective sequencing uh, reactions. Now, in the, same, in the case of uh, single cell sequencing, we are starting with a, an absolute minute amounts of mRNA from each cell. And what we need to, to do or try to do is to minimize the RNA losses during the conversion to cDNA, uh, but also at the same time obtain enough of DNA for sequencing without introducing too much bias. So um, that is actually quite a tricky proposition. And in general, single cell sequencing exper experiments uh, produce much noisier and uh, a lot more variable data than bulk sequencing. Some of this is due to the technical noise and the technical issues that are, uh, such as the introduction of, uh, of biases or errors during amplification. And some of it is due to an actual biological variation due to sort of the stochastic differences in transcription in each individual cell. Um, so the main sources of discrepancies between libraries from cells of the same type uh, is amplification, because as I mentioned previously, we are we, in single cell sequencing, we need to amplify massively up to one million fold, which can introduce a lot of error. And the uh, so-called gene dropouts, uh, where a gene is observed, even at, at quite moderate expression level in one cell, but it's actually not detected in another cell of the same type. And these dropout events can uh, occur due to uh, either a low amount of the mRNA in, in each individual cell due to sort of some stochastic differences in the expression, or also due to uh, inefficient mRNA capture, or less than perfect uh, efficiency of the reverse transcription reaction. Um, actually, the reverse transcription can, um, is, or can be rather an inefficient process. And uh, generally only a fraction of the total transcript in each cell actually get transcribed. Uh, it's usually somewhere uh, in the region of uh, 10, to, 10 to 20 percent, which of course introduces uh, a lot of technical noise, especially, and is problematic, especially for genes that are already expressed at quite low levels. Um, so uh, the Single cell RNA sequencing methods uh, have evolved very rapidly over the years, uh, and, there, and we've seen some massive improvements uh, in both the throughput and then and the linked sort of decrease in costs. The throughput has actually risen from tens of cells per study, which is uh, how it uh, how it started, being a completely manual process and each cell uh, being uh, handled and processed separately. Uh, to, uh, to uh, hundreds of thousands per cell, uh, hundreds of thousands of cells per study, uh, which is what we are seeing today with some of the technologies. And these are uh, thanks to advancing advances in multiplexing, uh, introduction of droplet technologies, and more recently in situ barcoding, uh, where the cells are actually fixed and the mRNA is barcoded inside each cell. So, uh, so now the number of single cells processed in each study has risen uh, from like one or very few individual cells uh, some 10 years ago to hundreds of thousands and sort of like pushing the uh, million uh, bar now in the experiment that we see today. Generally, however, um, 
all the single cell RNA seq methods follow the basic same workflow where you start with a solid tissue, which you then need to dissociate, isolate single cells from this mixture, uh, con uh, reverse transcribe your isolated RNA into cDNA, amplify it, uh, in some cases really massively, uh, then create sequencing library sequencing and do your analysis to ad identify uh, the different cell types uh, contained in the tissue that you started with. However, the different protocols will differ in at least one of the following aspects, um, such as cell isolation, reverse transcription, amplification, and all, all of those. And I'm actually going to talk uh, about a few of these in a bit more detail. Just a quick mention about the uh, unique molecular identifiers. Uh, these are tags or barcodes that enable identification of individual of uh, sequencing reads that came from the same individual transcript molecule, which can then help uh, with removal of amplification noises and biases during uh, the uh, analysis. But first, let me talk a, a bit about the different methods. Uh, uh, the various protocols used for cell isolation and capture, uh, which is one of the key variables. Um, the common approaches include micropipetting, like laser microdissection, fax sorting, micro droplets, and uh, microfluidic system for something like the blue down C1 chips. Um, now, these uh, differ uh, not only by throughput, obviously. You, you can process only a limited number of cells when you're doing uh, micro manipulation or basic micro dissection. Um, but a lot more when you're employing more sort of random capture methods, such as the micro droplet selection method. Um, and the second big difference is whether you can actually pre select the, or select a specific cell or a class of cells based on either their markers or morphology or some other quality, uh, which you can do uh, with the sort of more manual methods, like the micro thing, micro dissection, or even with fact sorting, where uh, you can just uh, select a specific population of cells based on their uh, fluorescent markers. But the micro droplet technology is all random capture, even though you can actually pre-sort with facts. So there is. Some, uh, some way of ensuring that you're uh, studying the cell population that you're most interested in. Um, so the capture strategy determines not only the throughput, as I already mentioned, some are more uh, labor intensive and manual, whereas others are very high throughput, like the droplet pipelines. And then how the cells can be selected based on the presence of uh, different markers, or whether they are being just randomly captured from a pool of cells. And finally, what kind of additional information besides the sequencing information you can actually get about these cells. Uh, once again, that would be the presence of some markers or uh, the, the morphology of cells with some of these methods like the laser micro dissection, or even like fitness of uh, cells prior, prior to sequencing, uh, whether they sort of made, made it out alive uh, uh, from the uh, isolation procedure or are already dead or damaged. So the most, uh, the three most widely used options are microwell based options, uh, microfluidic, so that would be the blue down C1 chips, and uh, droplet based methods like uh, Tanex chromium, which I'm going to talk about a bit later as well. Um, second um, a big difference uh, among the various methods uh, available today is the transcript coverage and the availability of the unique molecular identifiers, or UMIs. So there are, um, based on the transcript coverage, there are two main categories of methods. Uh, some of them uh, yield full-length or nearly full-length uh, coverage of transcripts, and these obviously have a great advantage if you're interested in uh, isoform usage analysis or uh, de detection of uh, differences in, uh, uh, in expression of, di uh, of different alleles, RNA editing, um, and things like that, and because they uh, better cover the whole transcript. Whereas the 
uh, tech-based uh, technologies, which are usually problem-based, capture either only the free end or the five end of each molecule, uh, and not the full length transcript. Uh, this has uh, the advantage of a generally um, higher throughput of cells and lower sequencing costs for cells compared to um, the uh, well-based or uh, full length uh, sequencing protocols. Uh, and this makes them particularly suitable for processing of large amounts of cells when you when um, what you want to do is to identify different cell, cell populations in a complex tissues or uh, reveal the heterogeneity in a tumor sample, for instance. Additionally, the tech-based protocols have the advantage that they can be combined with the uh, UMIs, which allows us to distinguish sequences coming from the same transcript molecules which then can help to reduce the amplification noise by allow, allowing um, almost complete deduplication of the sequence fragments during analysis. So basically you are uh, able to remove some of the amplification noise by knowing uh, how many reads and which reads came from the same one starting uh, molecule of mRNA. So um, here's just a a short and definitely not an exhaustive uh, list of the currently available or currently used uh, RNA sequencing methods and uh, the difference between them. Uh, I've included the link to the paper, so uh, for whoever has uh, a specific interest in any of these um, can head there and uh, check which what the differences are and what are the different advantages and disadvantages of the various protocols. There are actually several recent studies available which directly <laughs> compare several different protocols. And uh, there's a, a, a figure from one of them uh, where Siegenheim and uh, et al. compared five different protocols of uh, on the same sample of uh, mouse embryonic stem cells. And uh, by controlling for number of cells as well as the sequencing that the authors were able to directly compare the sensitivity, noise levels and costs of the different sequencing protocols. So um, one example of their conclusions you can see here, uh, which uh, in a, uh, uh, here in this figure which shows the number of genes that detected for a given um, detected, uh, detection threshold for the different methods. And as you can see, the differences are quite substantial. There's almost a twofold difference between uh, drop seek and small seek. So um, the correct choice of protocol can have a major impact on the study. And you need to think, think carefully about what protocol and uh, what methodology is best suited to your needs and what you want to discover uh, in your single cell expression study. So, um, so that's uh, all about the sort of background information on the technologies. And now I'm going to uh, move on to introducing a single cell expression atlas, where, which is a resource maintained uh, by our team at the EBI, uh, which uh, uh, tries to provide the information of where and under what conditions different genes are expressed at the level of individual cells. At the moment, uh, it contains uh, analysis results for close to a million cells. And we have uh, 123 single cell studies. And then the number is constantly increasing. And we're just uh, ahead of uh, a new release. So it's going to be substantially higher soon. Um, and uh, all this uh, is shown across different species. Uh, at the moment, we, we have data from 12 species, including all the major uh, uh, model organisms and uh, humans, of course. Um, so first, let me uh, in talk a bit about how the expression atlas works and how the data um, get into it. So what we start with is publicly available single cell expression data that uh, we collect from different resources and different repositories, which we then carefully curate uh, to ensure the highest possible standards of uh, 
uh, data in, um, in each study and uh, and to make sure that there's sufficient information about the samples as well as uh, the information about the technical aspects of each experiment to make that uh, to make that experiment really very really useful and uh, useful for the community. We then run all these experiments through the same uh, analytical pipeline and then uh, display the results uh, in uh, a hopefully user-friendly web interface. So this is uh, our analytical pipeline. Uh, at the moment, we can process both uh, plate-based and droplet-based uh, studies or uh, experiments, but the upstream processing uh, obviously has to differ a little bit for uh, between these two types of experiments. Uh, but the, uh, eventually, what you end up with is a table with row counts that includes all cells from each experiment, and this is then further analyzed using the SCUMPI uh, suite of tools, which then takes care of the cell filtering, normalization, dimension reduction, clustering and market detection, and that's the, um, that's the analysis that we then show on our website. So um, this is the Single Cell Expression Atlas homepage. There's a link down there, so you feel free to just follow along um, as I introduce some of the features. Uh, and uh, this is the site where you can discover gene um, expression analysis results at a single cell level or across different species and different studies. And because they've been run through the same pipeline, these are cross-comparable. Uh, there's a number of ways that we can search the data in Single Cell Expression Atlas. One of them is to just uh, browse all the experiments that we currently have in Atlas. And you can then further sort of refine this list by searching or filtering or reordering it using several parameters at the bar up here, which I've uh, highlighted using the red box. Uh, the second way, uh, if you are interested in uh, one gene in particular, is to just use the gene search box where you enter a gene symbol. For example, uh, or the example I'm going to use for this, the rest of this presentation, SST, uh, standing for somatostatin. Um, so if you enter that uh, symbol into the search box, you will get a list of all experiments that we currently have in Atlas where expression of um, SSD has been detected. In this list, you can see that there are uh, a number of columns in the results table, uh, species, marker gene, the, the experiment title, experimental variable, and number of assays, and you can use all of these to order and filter the results. Uh, by default, the experiments uh, where they, your gene of interest, as I've seen in this case, has been identified as a cluster marker, will be displayed first. Furthermore, um, you can uh, refine your analysis results using the pane on the left hand side, where you can filter uh, the list by species, organism, part, um, invert cell type, and uh, other categories. So uh, in this case, over here, I have uh, filtered our list uh, for, to get human experiments only. And uh, again, the experiments where SST is a cluster marker uh, is are uh, shown first. So um, let's have a look at uh, one of these experiments. So this is the experiment page in Single Cell Expression Atlas. Um, in the header, uh, highlighted here using the blue box. Uh, there are some basic information about, uh, or there is some basic information about this study and uh, a link to its, uh, to its publication. And underneath the header, uh, you can see a bar with different tabs, results, experiment design, supplementary info, and downloads. Uh, uh, and by default, the results tab is shown first. Uh, and in the results section, we visualize the analyzed uh, single cell expression data using the sort of widely used uh, T-SNE plots, one showing the clusters and one showing the actual gene expression. So uh, T-SNE stands for T-Distributed Sto Stochastic Neighbor Embedding, and it's a nonlinear dimensionality reduction method. So that's a, a technique that basically maps a set of high dimensional points 
um, such as cells with uh, different levels of uh, expression for thousands of genes. Uh, in a such a way that ideally um, uh, close neighbors remain close or mo the most similar cells remain close uh, and distant points remain distant. If you've noticed the TCNE perplexity uh, parameter, that's, a, that's a, a parameter of the TCNE which basically is an estimate of the number of affected neighbors uh, each point can have. And this is something that you can change uh, in the user interface and see how it affects uh, the distribution of cells in the, in the graph. So uh, within the TSNI, uh, we group the cells into clusters based on their gene expression uh, using the clustering algorithm in SCAMPI, and this is shown as different colors. Um, the K value here um, is Again, it's a parameter of the clustering algorithm, and it actually specifies the number of populations to define. And again, we uh, offer several sort of reasonable options, and you can uh, choose and interpret the results uh, and uh, see how which k to your mind best represents the actual variability in the, uh, the experiment. So, in effect, this. In one plot then actually contains two separate calculations. One is the TCNE distribution and one is the clustering and these two are actually independent. Um, in addition to coloring the, the TCNE by, uh, of, uh, or the distribution of cells by a cluster, you can also color them by metadata. Uh, so that's the information that we have uh, about these samples from the office. Uh, for instance, these can be the input uh, cell type if they provide it, uh, or in this case, uh, we have a, a metadata about the individual uh, disease, and you can pick one of these categories to sort of recolor uh, the T uh, sneak. So, in this case, I'm going to use the input cell types. So, now, as you can see, we've now colored the cell by their input cell type which is based on the analysis um, that the office provided themselves. And um, it's important to point out that this is, again, independent of the clustering. So, the, so it does not necessarily correspond to uh, the specific cluster. Um, you can also, so if you hover over uh, each individual point or uh, south interest, uh, a tooltip will uh, pop up. And uh, this contains additional information about the, the individual cell, such as its uh, identifier, some uh, additional metadata uh, or information about the sample it came from, or and in this case, the invert cell type. So in the second TCN plot, um, what you can see is the actual gene expression level for your gene of interest in each individual cell. And by hovering uh, over a particular point, you can uh, find out the exact CPM, which uh, stands for counts per million value uh, in that cell. So, um, as you can see on this slide, our gene uh, SST or somatostatin is particularly highly expressed is in this one cluster, cluster number nine. Uh, and from the inferred cell type annotations, we know that this actually represents the D or delta cell population from the pancreatic islets. The second tab in the results section uh, shows you the top five marker genes identified in each cluster and their expression across all the clusters. So uh, here you can see that the gene SSD we searched for is particularly highly expressed in cluster nine and is actually the top marker gene for this cluster. And again, if you hover over uh, the cell in a in a heat, in this heat map, you'll see that it's, it's mainly an expression uh, within that within each cluster. Uh, so, uh, apart from the results step, I would like to point your attention to the experimental design tab, uh, where you can find detailed information about each sample, such as the information about the donor, uh, the details about uh, the, the, the sample tissue um, and uh, 
analysis, technical information about the libraries, things like that. And lastly, uh, the, I would like to draw your attention to the downloads tab, where you can download the full curated metadata for each experiment, along with all the analysis results. And that is all from me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Uh, right, so the question is, how do you cluster the data? What algorithm, uh, algorithm do you use? So uh, uh, now we use Scampi, uh, so that's a, that's a whole suite of tools um, which uh, does the TSNI distribution and the clustering, so it's the, so it's the Scampi algorithm. Before we were using SC3, but now we're using Scampi for all our experiments. And uh, you can find the, actually, um, I skipped that bit, but uh, on each experiment page, uh, there is a tab called the supplementary information, which lists all the details about the uh, analysis pipeline uh, that was used to process that particular experiment. So uh, another question, what metadata comprises of? So um, generally, when we talk about uh, biological data, uh, especially in a sequencing experiment, what, uh, we commonly di divide these data into two categories, the raw data, which would be the uh, sequencing files, the fast few files, um, the actual you know, uh, lattice, uh, the, the sequencing output that you get, um, and the metadata. And the metadata generally refers to all the information uh, about the experiment as a general um, in general, so that would be all the information about the uh, the um, sample you started with, how you collected it, where it came from, uh, information of the details about the donor. Um, another uh, category of metadata would be how you process the the sample. Uh, so what what you did with it, uh, all the, the the protocols, the kits that you used what machines uh, you were using to produce the uh, raw sequencing files, and uh, also uh, what type of analysis you performed to arrive at uh, the conclusions that you drew from uh, each experiment. So all of these should ideally be covered in each experiment for people to be able to correctly uh, interpret the results and also re uh, reuse the data for their own analysis. Uh, um, yeah, or just uh, to corroborate the findings. Can we perform any alternative splicing analysis in the near future using this tool? If you are referring to expression uh, atlas, then uh, no, unfortunately, uh, I don't think that's uh, in the works at the moment. Uh, but uh, because the, the, it's, uh, the single cell expression atlas actually doesn't allow you to perform any uh, analysis of your own, but we, what it does is show um, is to show you uh, the results of analysis that we perform ourselves uh, across many many different experiments. So uh, it's not uh, an analytical tool per se. And uh, as far as I am aware, um, alternative splicing analysis uh, is not currently uh, on the list of. Uh, immediate improvements that we are planning for this resource. So that's a, that's a link to the second question. We'll be, be able to do RNA editing with the CA tool. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so not, not, not using the um, CA tool, but actually oral analytical pipelines are available in the, the Galaxy Cloud. Uh, uh, where I'm not sure if there are if I included links in our slides, but uh, I, I can include them later and get them those uh, get those to you, where you can use the uh, analytical pipeline that we've created uh, to perform your own analysis, and you can al al always sort of take that as a starting point and then include additional tools and uh, analyses. Either I can send you the, the links directly into the chat, or actually when you go to the single cell expression atlas homepage and scroll all the way down, you will find a section called tools, uh, which describes the, um, 
the pipeline workbook that we are using for the analysis, and uh, there, so there are, and you will be able to find links to um, the analysis pipeline that we use there. Right. So um, the default. Uh, so there's a question about what are the default criteria for single cell RNA uh, sequencing pre-processing, uh, like the IMI count, uh, number of mitochondria transcripts, um, etc. Um, so at the moment, because, uh, because we are still sort of developing the pipeline, we are not being very stringent when it comes to uh, the um, sort of filtering. Uh, well, the, the filtering that we're doing uh, is based on the number of genes detected. So it has to, uh, the threshold, if I remember correctly, is somewhere uh, in the region of 400. And also the number of cells uh, per uh, each gene. So the gene needs to be detected in more than uh, a certain number of cells uh, from that experiment. Um, at the moment, we are actually not doing any spiking uh, or mitochondrial, uh, spiking based uh, or mitochondrial ratio reads uh, QC, but that's uh, something that we're actively working on to incorporate in the very near future. Can you run uh, TCN on data acquired from different experiments? Uh, yes, yes, we can. And um, that's um, actually what the Atlas is, uh, is, is doing. Uh, we are running the same pipeline on different experiments and then showing the results in a, in a TCN form, or several of them actually. Uh, how compatible is your data with other tools like SORAD? Okay, uh, that is quite a specific and uh, technical question. I, to the best of my knowledge, it should be quite uh, compatible, but it's probably something that I'm going to get back to you, Martin, if you don't mind. And I can also put you in contact with our, by our informatician who developed the pipeline and who might be able to give you any specific um, guidance regarding the different tools and how um, complementary or uh, they are provided tools out there. Uh, what data integration tool is used to integrate data from different experiments? So at the moment, uh, we are uh, actually uh, processing each experiment separately. It's just that because we are using the same pipeline and the same sort of QC and thresholding methods, these should be broadly comparable. But we are at the moment not really integrating across uh, experiments as such. But it's again something that we're working on. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so uh, Martin has a very good question about our sequencing criteria because they are not very stringent at the moment. Uh, uh, the question is whether we will change the criteria in the future. The, answer, the short answer is yes, we are, that's something that we're uh, very actively working uh, on right now. And uh, the changes should be visible uh, or available very soon in the next couple of releases. And if so, will you repeat the analysis for experiments already in the database? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, whenever we do like a major change, to uh, the pipeline, we reprocess all the experiments that are already in the resource to make uh, sure that it's up to date and that they are still cross comparable. How does different TSNE values relate to biological interpretation of gene expression? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but basically the TSNE is just a, a Put extremely simply and not terribly precisely, it's a layout um, algorithm. That's a, that's a way how to pick the sort of most telling parameter in a very complex data set so that you can visualize it in a 2D. Uh, so the TSNE is all really about the distribution and keep the most similar cells in close proximity. It doesn't actually necessarily relate uh, to uh, the cell type or anything else. But obviously, the idea behind the dimension reduction is that you keep the cells that are most similar together. So cells that are close together in the T-SNE pot should be uh, ideally of the same type. I'm not sure if that actually answers the question. but. 
uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will have the same expression level for each particular gene, because there's a lot of vari uh, variability even within uh, cells of the cell, cell type. Um, yeah, uh, will the older version of our of our analysis still be available after the pipeline has been repeated? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, we are not currently archiving uh, old analysis results, uh, but obviously everything that is currently in Atlas is downloadable, and you can also download it as a as a, a tarball, a big what with chunk of data, uh, including everything. So that would be the way of archiving it, but uh, no, at the moment we are not providing any access to old analysis. Right, um, okay, thank you uh, guys for uh, all the questions uh, and for staying till the very end of this webinar. Uh, I just wanted to say that if you have any further questions, then please feel free to contact our help desk and we will direct you to the uh, best person to help you with the particular query.